Welcome to the UCL Center for Anesthesia student podcast series. This podcast will be featuring an introduction to cardiovascular failure, inotropes, and vasopressors. Oxygen delivery and shock. The majority of oxygen is transported via hemoglobin through the blood vessels to the cells. Some oxygen is also dissolved in the plasma, but the amount is so minuscule that it is commonly disregarded in the calculations of oxygen delivery. Oxygen capacity is the percentage oxygen saturation times 1.34, which is the oxygen content of 1 gram of saturated hemoglobin times the concentration of hemoglobin. Oxygen delivery is equal to the previously calculated oxygen content by the cardiac output. Shock is defined as when tissue perfusion is inadequate for metabolic needs. The consequences can be irreversible tissue hypoxia and cell death. There are many different types of shock that can occur. The first, hypovolemic or hemorrhagic shock, is when there is inadequate circulating volume, and therefore what is circulating does not perfuse the tissues at the sufficient rate. Distributive shock is increased vascular permeability. That means that intravascular volume moves to the extravascular space, causing inadequate circulating volume. Examples of this are sepsis or anaphylaxis. Neurogenic shock is the loss of sympathetic drive due to spinal cord trauma. Obstructive shock is when there is inadequate filling of the heart or inadequate preload, meaning that the cardiac output is not sufficient. Examples of this are cardiac tamponade or tension pneumothorax. Lastly, cardiogenic shock is when there is a failure of myocardial contractility leading to low cardiac output. By analyzing the type of shock it can then be treated for. As we will discuss later, it is important to understand what is causing the issue to most effectively correct for it. Vasoactive drugs are only used when other measures of correcting a low cardiac output have been sorted out and it is either an issue of ensuring preload is maintained or to augment contractility. For example, only after fluid therapy is proven to be not effective and there remain signs that the tissue is not being perfused readily enough will vasoactive drugs be used. There are several signs that you can look for that indicate shock. Some clinical markers are cool peripheries, delayed capillary refill time, skin mottling, altered mental state, and low urine output. Biochemical features are metabolic acidosis, elevated plasma lactate levels, and renal dysfunction. You can also use other parameters to look for indications that tissue perfusion is lacking, such as mean arterial blood pressure and heart rate. The cardiovascular system is designed to deliver oxygen and nutrients to meet metabolic needs. When it fails, shock ensues. As previously mentioned, oxygen delivery is dependent on oxygen content and cardiac output. Cardiac output is defined by stroke volume times heart rate. When shock occurs, a greater oxygen content can be temporarily increased. However, to correct for the shock, the cardiac output needs to be optimized. When there is low cardiac output, the heart rate is elevated in response to the metabolic demands of the body because the sympathetic nervous system is activated in an attempt to correct for the cardiac output loss. Therefore, heart rate is only treated for if there is brachycardia or slow heart rate, and stroke volume is the variable that is commonly treated during shock. Stroke volume is made of three components, preload, or the amount of blood returning to the heart before it squeezes, contractility, which is the force of which the heart squeezes, and afterload, which is the pressure against which the left ventricle has to contract. Preload will be the first component addressed. When it is lacking, first it is important to look for other potential causes of reduced preload, like hypovolemia, or reduced intravascular volume, and subsequently treat them. Test for these causes and treat them by giving fluid challenges intravenously to optimize ventricular filling. If the fluid challenge does not augment preload, then use vasopressors. These work by squeezing the peripheral circulation to return blood back to the heart. The next component, contractility, is affected by many factors. It is decreased by acidosis, alkalosis, cardiac disease like ischemic heart disease and cardiomyopathy, drugs like beta blockers and calcium channel antagonists, electrolyte disturbances like hyperkalemia and hypocalcemia, hypoxemia, hypercapnia, and parasympathetic nervous system stimulation.
We use positive inotropes to optimize contractility. They work by increasing the force of contractility of ventricles with each heartbeat. Afterload is the third and final component. We use vasopressors to act on alpha receptors to increase the vascular tone and therefore the afterload. Both inotropes and vasopressors are catecholamines. Naturally occurring catecholamines are both neurotransmitters and hormones. We use synthetic versions of these agents as vasopressors and positive inotropes. The diagram shown illustrates how to make the synthetic versions. The only difference between the different types of drugs is the amino group off the catechol group. They work on adrenic receptors, which are G-protein coupled receptors on the extracellular membrane. See in the lower picture the drug binds to the receptor on the membrane that causes a change in the intracellular structure, which then activates a G-protein. This G-protein initiates a secondary messenger cascade via something like adenylate cyclase and cyclic AMP. Catecholamines have a short half-life. The adrenic receptors that are activated by catecholamines are alpha-1 in vascular smooth muscle, specifically peripheral, renal, and coronary circulation paths, and when stimulated cause vasoconstriction and therefore increase systemic vascular resistance and therefore preload is augmented. Beta-1 receptors are in the heart and when stimulated increase contractility. Beta-2 receptors are in vascular smooth muscles, but unlike alpha-1, are only in peripheral and renal circulation paths, and have opposite effects when stimulated because it causes vasodilation and therefore reduces preload. Different effects occur on the body with each catecholamine because each has a different affinity for the receptors. Noradrenaline is mostly an alpha-1 agonist, but also somewhat beta-1. It can cause reduced renal perfusion in addition to its normal effects because of vasoconstriction activity and increased afterload will then reduce stroke volume and increase the oxygen demand. Adrenaline in low doses affects the beta-1 receptor. Its side effects are tachycardia, tachyrrhythmia, and increased oxygen demand. Adrenaline in high doses affects alpha-1, however it can reduce cardiac output at too high of a concentration. Dobutamine acts on beta-1 and can cause tachyarrhythmia and increased oxygen demand. It can also act on beta-2 that causes a risk of hypotension. Dopamine in low doses affects the dopamine receptor. Its side effects are tachyarrhythmia and increased oxygen demand. Dopamine in medium doses affects the beta-1 receptor. There's no benefit of renal function here. And dopamine in high doses affects the alpha-1 receptor and once again does not benefit any renal function but instead increases cardiac output. When administering catecholamines, it is important to remember that the overall goal is to correct for inadequate tissue perfusion rather than to maintain blood pressure. Also, seeing how they are dangerous drugs, there are several precautions that must be observed when administering. They should be given as infusions because they need to be carefully monitored and adjusted. The essential venous catheter, there's a skin necrosis risk if they extravasate. With the use of invasive monitoring like arterial lines and in a highly monitored environment like intensive care. With constant monitoring and administration of fluid because if a patient is dehydrated, inotropes and vasopressors worsen tissue perfusion. Titrated in order to use the minimum amount of drug required without causing adverse effects and in short time periods because vasoactive drugs do not cure the cause of cardiovascular failure. Instead, they treat the symptoms and overstimulation of the receptors can happen with prolonged treatment. There are other vasoactive drugs that are non-catecholamine and therefore do not work on adrenic receptors. They work further downstream the G-protein stimulated secondary cascade to increase contractility. There is no significant evidence that proves that these drugs improve outcomes and they are not commonly used because they are not considered first line. The first drugs are anoxamone and milrinone. They are phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitors and they prevent the hydrolysis of intracellular cyclic AMP, therefore improving the effects of this cascade. Levosimidin is a calcium sensitizer which increases the sensitivity of myocardial troponin to intracellular calcium
and this increases the contractility without increasing myocardial oxygen demand. Vasopressin, or ADH, is an endogenous hormone and increases the intracellular calcium. From this podcast, you should have learned what oxygen content, delivery, and shock are, cardiac output, stroke volume, and heart rate, how to use vasoactive drugs, what is preload and why do you use vasopressors, what is contractility and why do you use enotropes, types of cardiovascular shock, catecholamine behaviors, receptors activated, and non-catecholamine vasoactive drugs. The article was written by Dr. Julia Benham Mermetz, Dr. Mark Lambert, and Dr. Rob Stevens. This podcast is by Marcia Desjardins, Dr. Ravin Mystery, Dr. Rob Stevens, Brittany Porter, and Mimi Levi. Thank you for watching.